like it would be impossible. It looked like it would be a chaotic disaster. There was a spin put out that that's what was going on. You're either being used or people are going to make a lot of money off you or it's not going to happen. And so there was this game played for about four to five weeks up until literally the week or so before the event of people in or out. Back in Britain, Geldof's lineup was almost complete. But as usual, he wanted more. One of the icons of the age, Princess Diana. There must be an angel with my heart, yeah. Tonight, the prince and princess arrived back in London to attend a concert by the pop group Dire Straits. Tonight's performance is being given in aid of the Prince's Trust, a charity particularly associated with the royal couple. Geldof managed to get a free ticket from somebody because he certainly wouldn't pay and showed up and kind of corralled them in the corner and talked them into coming along to at least the, the opening of the Live Aid show. I thought it would be important that they came because at that time, you know, it was glamorous, there was the excitement around their relationship and stuff like that. And they represented, well, the country. He had royalty, and now Geldof wanted pop royalty. But the king of pop, Paul McCartney, was still holding out. The former Beatle hadn't performed live since John Lennon's death five years earlier. He was an artistic recluse. He hadn't played, hadn't performed anywhere. He was having his family life. And uh, Bob needed him badly for credibility. You know, one of the Beatles had to be in the show. Pete Smith and production manager Andrew Zweck were told to go to McCartney's offices, as Geldof put it, to bag the lion. There was a, a real sense of apprehension. <laughs> you know, Friday night, five o'clock, you know, go get Paul McCartney. So we all marched over to the office in Soho Square, very important, to discuss how the show was going to work. I was panicking. I had no idea how the show was going to work. And I was called upon to be the spokesman of how it was all going to be perfect and wonderful and technically professional and enhance Paul's career and he'd play in a fantastic light. But I was making it up, it's the truth of it. What if we go out there, you know, into Soho Square at six o'clock and he's said no, you know? I suppose you catch a train to Dover or something, you know? Because I'm not going back to see Harvey or Bob. But at the end of the meeting, he said, I was always going to do this show. And I said, well, uh, you know, why are you always going to do it? And he said, the management. So I said, Stephen Shrimpton, your manager? He said, no, 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 Pete, said, the management. So I thought, oh, Linda? You know, so I said to him, oh, he said, um, who do you think the management is? And I said, the kids? My kids were um, very keen on the whole thing. Uh, one or two of them were a little too small to you know, be aware of it. But um, I think the thing about Live Aid was everyone who, who could be aware, who was conscious, um, was aware of it. It galvanized the nation. With the last act in place, Andrew Zweck was finally free to concentrate on the greatest show on earth. We sat there on the Sunday in an empty stadium and sheer unadulterated panic set in. We had been neglecting this show and suddenly it dawned on us how were we going to pull it off? How were we going to put on 25 bands on a strict timetable in a very limited physical space? We're out of power in this stadium. We're drawing every amp that we've got here. We're fresh out of power. This is what Wembley Stadium have come this morning. They've said our plans to light the audience and so on. There's not an amp left in the place. But can we just get more generators in? The, well, I've already got three out there. I'm already at three generators. Get, get more, Andy, get more. I remember panicking in the very start of the week with Bob telling him, we haven't got enough of anything. There's not enough power here. We don't have the physical size to put all the bands on. There's no room to put all the artists. We haven't got enough catering. I haven't got enough staff. Where am I going to get it? We're getting too big and spectacular. We're, we're, the resources are drying up. Zweck's most pressing problem was another of Geldof's brainwaves, a revolving stage. 
This is um, stage one, two, and three. The reason it has to be is like this is that it's unlike other pop shows. It's not when you go on, it's when you come off. Every band is 20 minutes. We have to do that to fit in the appeal for money twice on the hour. We knew it from some industrial trade show, which had abandoned it because it didn't work. But it was this large revolving turntable, very, very heavy, very unsuited for this purpose. We were absolutely flying by the seat of our pants. Once it was installed, it kept malfunctioning and it kept sinking into the wood because of its weight. I think my only concern was always whether this bloody stage would get stuck or not. And I said at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, you better get some horses in. What I meant was you just got to get lots and lots of people to physically turn the thing round. I was going, you must be fucking joking, you know, <laughs> underneath the bloody stage, you know. Well, this was utter rubbish. Soon became a myth, because there was no room under that stage, even for a rat. The horse was a big possibility. He was there, wasn't he? If the stage hands were a bit clapped out, over at the BBC, things didn't seem much better. <laughs> SIO, EP781. It was like the 1940s. If they'd all pipes, it would have been perfect. They had a blackboard and they'd drawn these little dots. Now, sat one will go from here, and there'll be these guys with beards and sort of sandals writing things down. At 400, oh, 400, we'd be there. And it really was like that, like a war room. Give me stations booking, please. They presented this running order. And we laughed. We burst out laughing. They said at 1702, Sade would take the stage, and at 1917, The Who would come off. And we said, this is not how the music business works. This is not rock and roll. You're not going to tell The Who they have to leave the stage. You're not going to tell these artists what to do. And we laughed at the BBC. With only days to go, America was still unravelling. Geldof badly needed the artists from We Are The World to give the show global credibility. A showdown took place between Ken Cragen, Mike Mitchell and Harvey Goldsmith. We actually ended up all meeting together because there was a point where we suddenly felt we were being competitive. And um, I just wanted to get that out of the way really fast because that's the last thing we needed. It just wasn't on the agenda. So we had to sort out with them what they were trying to do, because they were going to try to do their own concert. With only three days to go, Ken Cragen struck a last-minute deal to appease the artists who were still holding out. So when I got the call saying, we're in, I sort of heaved a sigh of relief too, because the stories would have been, where were they? Rift between and all that stuff. America was finally falling into place, but at Wembley, a massive row was brewing. Everyone in Britain was giving their services for free, except Wembley, who insisted on charging for the venue and their staff. Wembley were the biggest pains in the arse of the whole thing. They were really not going with the plot. They wanted money, they wanted this, they wanted that. And like, I was just gonna fuck them, you know, no. An 11th hour meeting was arranged with Wembley's deputy chairman, Jarvis Astaire. Suddenly, Bob Geldof let it rip and used a number of four letter words Jarvis was starting to really dig his heels in, and the more he was digging his heels in, the more Bob was swearing, and the more Jarvis was getting seriously upset. That man, Goldoff, has just sworn at me then. And uh, I said, so you've never met Bob before then. Um, and he said, I'm not having it. I'm not having it in my, uh, in my boardroom. I was, to some extent, offended that he was in the boardroom at Wembley having a proper business meeting and he was behaving like the wild ruffian that I thought he was in the first place. It actually got very close to blows as it happened. And I said to him, if you want to talk to me about an event at Wembley and you're here, right, don't use that language and don't bang on the table. And at that point, he was, uh, it, it was like, I'm not having this, I'm not having this show in here, I'm not having that man in here. And we all thought it was all off again. At the 24th hour, 
Wembley reached a deal. Live Aid agreed to pay the stadium a quarter of a million pounds for the day. It wasn't just the big guns. In Cheshire, fruit and veg man Tony Butterworth was having his own battle with bureaucracy. The main stumbling blocks were actually <laughs> Macclesfield Borough Council, if I'm telling the truth, because you know, they really didn't want it to be around here. They were absolutely sure that the hippie convoy was going to arrive from uh, Stonehenge, you know, uh, and, uh, and there's going to be dirt, dust and other unsavoury activities. We had to go the following day to the town hall, and the place was full of people objecting, and there was an old lady. Right? She looked like... Miss, Mrs. Marples, you know, big coat on and a, and a, and a portmanteau. And, <laughs> and she was sat right at the back. And I kept turning around and looking at her, like, you know. And I thought, oh, she's trouble. Anyway, it came to, came to the end of the sort of summing up. And this old woman at the back put, stuck her hand up, you know, and I thought, oh, this is it. And she said, uh, I just want to say, there are people dying right now as we speak. And she picked her bag up and went. And she walked past me and went. And uh, these three judges said, uh, there's your licence. <laughs> One day to go, and the stars were wheeled out onto the BBC to promote the show. While along the corridor, the foot soldiers were receiving their marching orders. We were given no guidance at all about the kind of programme that was wanted. We didn't know whether we were covering an event or participating in it. Absolutely no preparation and absolutely no rehearsal at all. I mean, I can remember being called to a meeting, but mostly it was just lots of technical jobbies uh, from the kind of outside broadcasting, talking about, you know, miles of cables that they were going to use and satellite links and all sorts of rather butch-sounding technology, which is... We were kind of just gibbering in the middle of it. We were all given little folders with the running order and show up. That's all you could do, show up. It was as, as, as amateur and as shambolic as that. But one man was more than relieved to see the BBC vans roll into Wembley. BBC marching with their clipboards and they've got this running order and they said, this is how it's going to be, it's all going to work like clockwork, we're going to interface with Philadelphia. And I thought... Well, I believe them now, you know, in the beginning I thought this was pie in the sky, but once they arrived on site, team-handed with all of the staff and all of the clipboards and all of the equipment, I thought, hang on, I'm not alone here. Then, the time came to try out the stage. The one dry run we got, because time was running out, it did fail, and panic set in and uh, then we again we called in volunteers we called everybody we could find on it please come and help it was completely like keystone cops you had big burly men running around with amps getting stuck in the middle of the stage turning people s still trying to plug out and seeing wires all cross things falling over is that the familiar face of Janice Lark? <laughs> Janice, how's it going? Things are going uh, really well down here at Wembley. We've just missed... I remember having to be, well, lying, basically, to Terry. You know, no, no, it's all fine, it's all going to be hunky-dory. You could feel the panic, because there was no way that stage was going to go anywhere. We panicked, as usual. <laughs> it would be a long night for Bob Geldof. At two o'clock in the morning, he was awoken by a phone call. You too wanted to pull out of the show. We probably threw a wobbler because we weren't getting a sound check. That would be very like us. Yeah. I don't remember that. Do I do you, remember do you trouble remember over a sound check, yeah. Geldof, by now exhausted after weeks of sleepless nights, spat out his familiar response. Fuck him. And Live Aid, rocking all over the world, is here on BBC4 tomorrow at nine. Next tonight, the story of how rock and roll grew up in another chance to see our new rockumentary, Forever Young. <laughs>